Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. A Layman's Challenge to the Rapture Theory. That's the book. It's out in stores now. It's written by Peter Ballone, and Peter is right here with me now to talk all about it. Peter, thank you for being here tonight. Glad to be here with you. Can you tell me what readers can expect in A Layman's Challenge to the Rapture Theory? That's a bit of a complicated question because the book itself is designed for two things. One, it's designed to contradict the prevalent theory among mainstream Christians as to what happens with the rapture or what they believe the rapture is. And then the second thing is to teach them how much they don't know about the seven holy days that picture the complete plan of God. Peter, what gave you the idea or the inspiration to sit down and write this and release it? Well, first of all, one, the rapture, or what I thought was the rapture, and you know, you hear your Protestants running around going, you know, I'm going to be raptured up, and I always wondered what the heck they were talking about. Well, I had an opportunity through my previous writing. This rapture book is actually my second book that I wrote. The first one, it was When Time Finally Runs Out, and I had a bit of a website on Facebook, and I got to talk to various and sundry people. Well, I got to talk to this one fella who thought he was the Bible Answer Man. We were trying to find a a common area, and I basically told them I didn't understand uh, what the rapture or how they perceived the rapture was all about. And we began to sort of talk, if you will, you know, I mean, right back and forth. The things that he were telling, that he told me were contradictory to what I understood and to what Scripture said. So I would contradict him, and eventually he left off because his real intent was to convert me back to mainstream Christianity. What he wound up with was an empty hand because there was no way I was going back into that. So I decided that, okay, he gave me some bits and pieces, so I decided that I was going to research it myself. And when I did, I said, this has to be written. It has to be challenged because theoretically it's false. Is this something that took you a long time to write and then put through the publishing process? No, no. The publishing process actually took longer than the writing. Mm. Before I started to write, I understand your question, very intriguing question, actually. Before I started to write, I have a gym coach. I basically would throw things on him, ideas, concepts, and then he would, you know, he was my sounding board. Mm. And if we could back up a moment, what actually I had done prior to this was I had completed a book, and I called it A Layman's Challenge to the Book of Galatians, okay? I had actually started to get it printed. So when I did write about the rapture, I showed Larry, my coach, the manuscript, and he said, Peter, this has got to come out before Galatians. He says, folks have to see this first, Mm. as basically to establish credibility. Peter, have you given any thought to what's next, writing another book? Yes. (laughs) Actually, I'm already there. My third book is at the publisher, and it's A Layman's Challenge to Eternal Security, or Once Saved, Always Saved. I have on my computer the fourth book, which is to talk about Ezekiel's Temple the third temple to come. Hmm. So this stuff's just pouring off of me like water. Well, this is certainly an interesting read. The name of the book is A Layman's Challenge to the Rapture Theory. It's written by Peter Ballone, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
course, you can find this everywhere that you shop for your reading material, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Peter, thank you again for stopping by the show here tonight. I had a really great time talking with you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Joining me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Christine Scaglione. Christine, thanks for joining me here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Wanted to congratulate you on having a new book out in stores right now. It's called Lena's Lollipop. Can you tell me about it? Yeah. For young readers, it's a story about a little girl who visits a candy shop with her nana. And while she's there, amidst all this amazing candy, she makes a secret wish. And when she does, she thinks of something that her nana told her, which is hopes and wishes find a way of coming true. Now, I don't want to spoil the ending for anyone, so I'm not going to tell you what actually happens. <laughs> but I wanted to also add that there's kind of a more important underlying story there as well about Lena's character and mm. the care and selflessness she shows throughout the story, even in the face of disappointments. So as a writer and as a mother and a grandmother and someone who's worked with young children for many, many years, that was the more important story I wanted to tell. When you say young children, about how young do you think would be into this? You know, it depends. I would say ages four to eight, but, you know, the illustrations are amazing. So I think, mm. you know, you might get some younger kids who would be captivated by that. To me, I know with my own children growing up, like, they loved to be read to and look at pictures even when they got a little bit past it, you know. So, you know, you might have a nine or ten year old in there as well. You're right. The illustrations are wonderful. This was illustrated by Elliot Hawk. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, well, it was a process. I had a hard time finding an illustrator that I really liked. The illustrations were so important to me. I love reading children's books with my own children, with my grandchildren. I worked in a pre-K for 10 years. I mean, that's just one of my favorite things to do. Mm. And I love pictures and books. You know, that's what draws me to a book. So that was super, super important for me. So it, it took me a good deal of time to find him, but I am so glad that I did. So you got to tell me, where did the idea for this story come from? It really came from the time I spend with my grandkids. I mean, I am forever telling them stories, especially about myself when I was younger. So I knew I wanted to kind of write this for them, you know, so that they'd actually have like one physical story to hold on to. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the little things that happen in the book are actually things that happened in my own childhood. Like there's a part where Lena and her Nana are walking on the avenue with all the shops. And that's my own memory of walking with my grandmother on White Plains Road in the Bronx and like mm. just being overwhelmed by the stores and the smells and the sounds and the people, you know. And even the actual story about the lollipop is something that happened to me when I was younger. So there's, there's a lot of little things going on in there. Wow. Then when that day came, you got the first copy and you got to hold it in your hands and look at it for the first time. What was that like for you? To me, it was super scary. <laughs> it was super scary because I said, oh my gosh, now I actually have to put myself out there. Mm. You know, up until then, it was just my family who saw it, you know, but, but now I'm like, wow, there's going to be a lot of people who see this. And that, that was scary for me. Mm. Is this your first book then? It is, yes. Congratulations. Thank well, you what so advice much. would you have now to people listening who are just about to do that same thing? They're authors that want to get their first work out. Well, definitely if they're like me and if they're feeling scared or intimidated, you know, oh gosh, what if no one likes this? You know, what if I don't sell a single copy? You know, mm. I would just say, I know for myself, I felt like if the day comes that I'm on my deathbed, I'm never going to say, wow, I wish I sold more copies. But if I didn't try, I would have said, wow, I really wish I would have at least given it a shot, you know, mm. and I'm happy I did. Are there any more adventures that Lena and Nana have in the future that maybe you've been thinking about putting out there as well? Honestly, there definitely are. I already have a few more stories written. So now it's, it's the process of, you know, going through that, you know, doing the illustrations again and getting them exactly the way I want them. I, I feel like I learned a ton through this experience. So, you know, I might do things a little bit differently next time, but there hopefully will be a few more books with Lena and Nana. Well, I really appreciate you spreading the message of selflessness and of care in this children's book. It's called Lena's Lollipop. It's written by Christine Scaglione and is published by Fulton Books. 
You can pick this up everywhere that you shop for reading material, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, everywhere. It's been great talking with you tonight, Christine. Thanks again for stopping by the show. Yeah, absolutely, Corey. Thank you so much for having me. The book I have here now says that wisdom is a rare treasure that people need but seldom ever find, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. The book is called Pew Proverbs. It's written by Dwayne Pew, and he's right here with me now to talk with me about it. Dwayne, thanks for coming on the show tonight. Well, I appreciate you having me. Can you tell me all about Pew Proverbs? Well, the book basically is a story of principles and truths that God's taught me throughout my life. We live in an age where people are getting bombarded with information from all types of directions and trying to sort what's true, what you can really trust. Mm. And so the book is basically these things that I have found and encapsulated in little short sentence forms of how I've seen it work and benefit my life and observed it working in the lives of others. Mm. So, Dwayne, what gave you the idea to take all these proverbs, all this wisdom that you've gathered, and put it in book form and publish it for the world? Well, I, I never intended to do it as a pastor and a, a speaker. I've given these things out as God's taught them to me throughout my life. Hmm. A little over a year and a half ago, in a five-month span, I had three different individuals as I was counseling them or just talking about something and gave out one of the few proverbs that sort of summed up the truth that they needed. And they said, have you ever thought about writing these down and where you got them from and how you've seen them play out in your life and the life of others? So after three people did that, not knowing each other in a five-month span, I said, well, my goodness, I, I might need to pray about doing this. And I did. And so that's how I came about of writing the book. Hmm. Did you have any specific readers in mind when you were putting this together? Well, not really in, in the sense of a specific reader. What I would say is a lot of the things in the book are things that I learned when I was young, but also if you read the book, you'll see there are things that I'm still learning or have learned as an adult as the different seasons of life come. These truths have become to the forefront of my mind of, okay, here's the principle that needs to be understood, and here's how to encapsulate it in one or two sentences so people can grab it rather than having to you know, read volumes of stuff about it. Mm. Was this book something that took you a long time to both organize and write and then put through the publishing process? The truth is, no, it took me a lifetime to live it. But as far <laughs> as writing it, I would say about six months. I actually, at first, did not intend it to be for publication. It was just going to be in sort of a loose notebook type form for my family and friends that ask it. Mm. But I have some friends that had helped other people publish things, and I sort of wanted them to edit it so it was in a good form. And when they read it, they said, you know, you ought to really publish this for people who don't know you and needs to be in bookstores and things because the truths will change people's lives. What was the day like for you then, Dwayne, whenever you got that first copy, you got to hold it in your hands? Well, you, you may think this uh, bizarre. I, I actually thought, is this all it is? <laughs> but on the outside, it just looks like another book, like any other book. So that first thought, and then the thought came to my mind, yeah, but the things that are in there, I know that they're life-changing. Mm. And so though it looks like a book like any other book, my prayer was, God, let somehow people look at the outside of the book and be curious enough to see the golden truths that you've taught me and bless my life and may it bless others. Mm. And now what advice would you have to the authors listening right now who are just starting out? They want to get their first book out there for people. Well, one of the things I would say is if you talk about what you're passionate about, what you're thinking about writing about, and you found that it resonates with people, it, it scratches an itch that they have or whatever, I would say that would be a good motivation to say if it's helped me and it's something on my mind and heart and helped others, then I, I need to put this down in some written form. If for no other purpose that after I pass off the scene, these things are still available for somebody to glean something from them that would uh, help them. So write it down if you see uh, other people being impacted by what you're passionate about. Hmm. The name of the book is Pew Proverbs. It's written by Dwayne Pew, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
You can get this everywhere like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Dwayne, thanks again for stopping by the show. I had a great time learning about Pew Proverbs and talking with you. Thank you very much, and I hope it helps you and many other people. God is so amazing in how he works, and readers are going to see that in the new book by Amy Crane. It's titled, In My Right Mind, My Life with Epilepsy. Really happy that Amy is here with me now to talk all about it. Amy, thank you for joining me tonight. It's great to be here. What a wonderful story you have to tell in this book. Can you tell me what readers can expect in In My Right Mind, My Life with Epilepsy? My book is about my experience of growing up with epilepsy. And I wrote about how epilepsy affected my mental health and my social opportunities and even my education. Hmm. After having had seizures in my childhood and teen years, in my junior year of college, God opened doors for me to have epilepsy brain surgery. Wow. And eventually I did have brain surgery and it changed my life. Hmm. And in my book, I share my faith in God and how he comforted me both before and after my surgery. Amy, what persuaded you to sit down and write your story for the world and have it published? I have a unique story, mm -hmm. and I knew that many people don't know about epilepsy or understand it, and there's a stigma associated with epilepsy, mm -hmm. and I'm a success case. And I wanted others to realize that some people with a disability can still go on to college and become an independent adult. And there's so many people in this world that need an encouragement. Mm -hmm. And Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As a Christian, I believe it's so important to share what God has done in our lives and be that light in a dark world. That's one of the reasons I wrote my book. Wow, Amy, I can see so many people being inspired by your book. Now, did you have a specific group of readers in mind when you were writing this? So my target audience is mainly people with epilepsy and those who have a loved one with epilepsy. My story will be one of encouragement to those that are in some way impacted by epilepsy. Also, anyone that enjoys reading an inspirational story would love reading my book. Mm -hmm. How long were you working on this? Did this take you a long time to write and then put through the publishing process? So I started my book actually years ago. I published my first book years ago, and then I more recently wanted to do a revision of it. My second revision started probably three years ago, and then after I had much of my manuscript done, I contacted Christian Faith Publishing, and they accepted my manuscript. So from that point, it took me about two years to go through the writing process and to get the editing done. You know, I'm one that wants things done correctly. So mm -hmm. I took my time and I didn't rush to get it published because I wanted it to be done a certain way. Yeah, certainly wise to take your time and make sure that everything's done just right. Now, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of being a published author, having your work out there for the world? Just knowing that I'm having an impact on other people's lives in a positive way mm -hmm. and that at least through my book, other people can see Jesus in my life. After that two years of working on this book, it's hard work. It's not easy. There are a lot of hoops you got to jump through, and it can be very trying. What was the feeling like whenever you got to hold that first copy in your hands? It was a moment when God spoke to me and said, well done, my good and faithful servant. It was a very, I want to say, rewarding moment. It was a moment when I knew that I had fulfilled something that God had led me to do. Hmm. And that in and of itself was just a great moment to hold that book for the first time. Have you given any thought to writing more, maybe publishing more in the future? At this time, I don't have uh, another book that I want to write, but I love to write. And mm. if God were to put something on my heart and mind to write it in the future, certainly I'd be open to that. Readers are truly going to be inspired with this one. It's called In My Right Mind, My Life with Epilepsy. It's written by Amy Crane, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can find this everywhere that you pick up your reading material, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Thank you again for joining me tonight, Amy. I had a great time learning just a little bit more about epilepsy and learning about your book. 
Well, I appreciate being with you tonight. I just hope that many people are blessed as they, they read my story. Many of us could use some positive change and renewal in our lives. And that's what author Wade A. Hartzell Sr. has written about in his new book, Radical Change, a 40-day journey toward the transformed and renewed you. Really happy that Wade is sitting here with me now to talk all about it. Wade, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Corey. I appreciate it. So Radical Change is a 40-day journey. Like I said, what's this book all about? Basically, it's a discipleship book. Years ago, I was sitting in a church, and uh, we had an individual got saved. Everybody congratulated him and sent him on his way, and we never seen him again. I just kind of put it on my heart that the church needs to have a tool in its hand that can help these individuals understand what Jesus is about and change their life. Hmm. And I uh, began writing a book several years ago, and it took a while for God to bring it all to fruition. But Jesus walked on this earth for 40 days, and he spent he spent those 40 days after he transfigured with his disciples, teaching them how to live a different life separated from him. And that's where the idea of 40 days comes. I think it takes 40 days for Jesus to really kind of invest in us. And the book actually helps churches and individuals partner along with others that want Jesus to change their life, but not sure how. And this is kind of a tool that I put in the hands so that people can walk alongside somebody else and help them radically change their life for Jesus and continue to pay it forward. Hmm. Wait, is this the first time you've written or published a book? Yes, this is definitely the first time. But uh, in all honesty, I didn't even expect it to be published. <laughs> I just sent it <laughs> off to get somebody to kind of help me, guide me in the uh, in the liturgy part when I sent it off. And they published it. It was a complete surprise to me. And it's a true act of what God is doing. And I know that God's got his hands in the book. Mm. Was this something that took you a long time to do then? Yes, it was. It's been about anywhere from about eight to 10 years. I wrote a good chunk of it several years ago, and then just kind of things happened, and they got put on the back burner. And then uh, right around the time COVID hit and started vamping up, God really pressed it on my heart to get this thing finished to be used as a tool in our own church. And that's kind of why I sent it off to publishers, just to kind of correct some of my mistakes. And like I said, didn't anticipate it getting to where it's at, but thankful for what God's doing. Wow, this was a long time coming. You said upwards of eight to 10 years going into this. What was it like then when you finally got to hold the first copy in your hands? To be honest with you, it's still kind of unfathomable. <laughs> you know, when I Through the whole process, once I got a picture of what the cover was going to be like and then actually got a hold of the book, I just can't believe that I became a published author. You know, I, I didn't even start reading until years ago. It just wasn't something I was interested in. Mm. You know, at about the same time I started writing is about the same time I started picking up books myself and reading them. So for God to take somebody like that and to make him a published author is just amazing of what God can do in each of our lives when we surrender to him. And Wade, now that you are a published author, what is the most rewarding aspect of it for you? Just knowing that I'm going to be able to help other people to be able to, you know, my goal is to get this into the churches. I think so many churches don't quite have an understanding of what discipleship is, especially your smaller churches. I don't think they have the tools and the means to have a program in the churches. And we often mistake our midweek Bible studies as discipleship. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, discipleship to me is when you invest in somebody personally and walk alongside of them. This book, the greatest thing for me is this will actually put that into other people's hands. You know, when somebody wants to walk with Jesus, but not sure how to do it, I think this is just a tool along with the Bible that will help those individuals. So that's what I'm excited about. Hmm. What are the chances that we'll be seeing more books from you in the future? If my wife has her way, probably pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, quite a few ideas that I have that I've written down, and uh, she quite often tells me that she wants to see it put in a book form, too, especially some of the things that we're doing now in our church. But hmm. Like I said, uh, I'm amazed what God did with this one, and I, you know, I'm not going to count him shy. There's no doubt that he could do it again if he chooses to. Absolutely. A lot of people listening right now are authors just starting out. So, Wade, what's the best piece of advice that you could give to them? I guess I would say it's just, you know, don't worry, don't fear. There are so many other organizations that are out there that will help you along the process. Mm -hmm that you're not in it alone. And that was one of the first things I learned is, is this isn't something you have to do on your own. God has put many people in, in, in the right positions to help you along and not fear. If you feel that that's what God has called you to do, put it out there and trust him to do the work with it. You know, he's given you the abilities and the gift to write it. And he's given somebody else the ability and the gifts to help you along the process. So we just got to learn to trust other people as well. The name of the book is Radical Change. A 40-Day Journey Toward the Transformed and Renewed You. This is written by Wade A. Hartzell Sr., and this is published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
Of course, you can find this everywhere like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Wade, thanks again for joining me here tonight. I had a great time talking with you. Thanks, Corey. Wish you the best. I'm happy to welcome back to the Reader House Author Roundtable, author Ivy Green. Great to be chatting with you again, Ivy. Thank you so much for being here again. Well, thank you for having me. Well, last time you stopped by, we talked about the puppy dog Sonny and his adventures with Wally the Catfish. Now, Sonny's back again with another adventure. You have a new book about it in stores right now. It's called Sonny's Adventures with Little Duke. So can you tell me about what Sonny's up to this time? Yes. Sonny, he uh, lives in the south, so he's never seen snow. And Little Duke lives in the north, and there's lots of snow. Sonny gets to go visit Little Duke this time for a month while his owners go on vacation. So while he's there visiting Little Duke, he gets to uh, play in the snow. He gets to go to dog parks, which he never gets to go where he lives because he lives on a lake. And he has, you know, all the freedom in the world. So he's loving all that. And he learns about birds that fly south because Sonny has the ability to talk to other animals. And, you know, that's a little magic in the story. And he can talk to Little Duke. That's what it's about. He's visiting. Sonny's visiting Little Duke up north and getting to know about what other places are like. And he even gets to get his first chicken taco. So he is a really happy puppy. <laughs> Ivy, can you remind us again what sorts of readers that you had in mind with this? Yes. Really, the ages are from the mom or dad or a babysitter reading the book to infant, you know, all the way up to, oh, I have a nephew that's nine years old that just loves the book. Mm. And then I have a nephew that's three, and he won't put it down and he won't let no one have it. So, <laughs> you know, the ages are all through there. I'm just happy that the children really like it. Mm. I'm hoping that it gets in the schools here and there because it shows the relationship between an animal and a little boy, how close they can be. So did you find writing Sonny's Adventures with Little Duke any easier than maybe when you were writing about Wally the Catfish before? Well, no. When I sit down to write these stories with Sonny, it just flows out of me. Mm. It's easy. I have so many stories written, so many books written, that Sonny will last forever. <laughs> And and it's and no, it is really easy because Sonny was a real pup, and mm. I had him years ago, and he was smart. I mean, he <laughs> he would do things that I just was amazed at. I almost thought he was human. So no, to sit down and write about him is easy as as, and I'm glad I'm because I love writing stories with him in it and things he does and finds and fixes and he likes his mysteries and he solves them. You know, at the end of the book, so that it's really good. And I love seeing what stories you come out with next. So can you give us maybe a little idea of what might be coming up ahead? Yes. Next story is Sonny meets Clyde the Pony. Hmm. Sonny gets to go to a wildlife center where his friend finds a aisle that has a broken wing. So they take it to the wildlife center to get see if they can get it fixed. And he finds all these animals that, he, you know, he, he never knew anything like that existed. And he goes and he sees his pony all by itself. So he goes over and talks to the pony and he asks the pony's name. And the pony says, well, my name's Clyde, but I don't like that name. And suddenly he had to tell him that that name was a good, strong name. And then the pony liked it. But the pony has a bad leg. So that's why he's there at the center. So he wanted to know if he was going to get to go back home or whatever in time. And he says, no, I'm here forever because they took me in because I have a bad leg and they're going to keep me. So it's a good story about him and just the wildlife center and teaching children that there's help out there for animals and my way of using Sonny as a tool, you know. It's a great story. I think readers should definitely check this book out. It's called Sonny's Adventures with Little Duke. It's written by Ivy Green and published by Newman Springs Publishing. Of course, you can find this everywhere. You pick up books like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Ivy, I really enjoyed having you back on the show again. Thank you for joining me and hope we can do it again soon. Oh, me too. Thank you very much. The Laughs Never Stop in the new book out in stores right now by Brian Vernier. It's titled All in a Nutshell, and Brian is right here with me to talk about it. Brian, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. 
Well, it's great to be talking with you here tonight, Brian. Can you tell me about All in a Nutshell? What can readers expect? All in a Nutshell, I wrote probably 20 years ago, and I actually started writing love poems to my wife back then. And then I started writing short stories, and then I started adding characters to them. And this is one of the stories that I came up with. I guess I don't even know how. I just kind of <laughs> wrote it, and it just happened. <laughs> What kinds of readers do you think would be really into this? I think, I really think, everybody's asked me about an age group on it. I, I really think it's for any age group. I have mm. friends and people that have called me and they're like, I'm 51. And they're like in their 50s or 30s and 20s. And they're, they buy it for their kids, but they love it. They, it has such a great story to it and everything like that. Have you ever published or anything like that before this? No, sir, I have not. Wow, it's such a big deal to have your first book out there on shelves. How how's it feel now to be a published author? <laughs> it feels really good because in reality, we kept it from everybody. Basically, <laughs> me and my wife were the only ones that knew. Oh, wow. So when the book came out, we had our kids over and everything, and we laid books out in front of them, and they, they about fell on the ground. Wow. <laughs> what was your reaction then when you got it in the mail, that first copy, you got to take it out and hold it for the first time? Oh, my Lord, I was so excited. I actually was a little bit, I was a little teary-eyed, mm -hmm. you know, and my wife was as well, because she helped me so much on it. I mean, I wrote it and everything, but she really helped me with the layout. She really helped me with the illustrations. I was kind of at the end of my rope. I mean, the illustrations took the longest, and I was just like, I'm done with illustrations. That's good. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 no. She was really there for me through this whole thing going, no, we're going to make this book perfect. And I completely agreed with her. Mm. You had said that this is one of the stories that you have written. So is there more after this? Do you plan on maybe publishing more? Oh, yes, for sure. I will. I have them. Um, I've been going through them. I have probably another five to seven that I've already written back in that time frame about 15, 20 years ago or so. A lot of people do ask me if I'm going to write a follow up to Charlie and Norman, that is the character's names. We're not sure on that yet. I've been kind of kicking it around, but not positive. Brian, I'm kind of getting a sense that writing is an easy thing for you. The words just seem to flow out and you have a lot of ideas. Do you ever get writer's block or does the going ever get tough for you? I do on some things. A lot of what I write basically comes from my heart. I know what I'm writing. I've had people ask me to write them some poems like for an anniversary, a church anniversary or for Christmas. And if I don't really connect with them, then yeah, I do have trouble. I uh, like I can come in my I can come in back in my room and be alone, and I can write a poem, and I mean a good sized poem, and probably like an hour. All my stuff is done in a poem form. I can write a good sized Christmas poem in probably an hour, and if I get writer's block, it could take me three days mm -hmm. to get one to come out. So I know that doesn't seem like that long, but when I know my pace of writing, it's a long time. Do you ever battle that inner editor while you're writing? You're just trying to get the words out, but you keep second guessing what's going down on paper? Oh, all the time. Mm. All the time. All the, I sit and read it to myself out loud. And yes, I, I really do. I really do. Uh, how do you get that inner editor to shut up so the words can just get out of your head? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, that that <laughs> inner editor is not really a really good listener sometimes. But, mm. you know, and then. A lot of times when I write a story, I write keywords on the top of the page, mm. like whatever I'm writing about. And then I just start writing uh, usually four line verses. And then after I write them all, then I basically go back through and I'll put them in the direct, correct order that they need to go into. Brian, so many of the people listening to us right now are authors just starting out. They want to get their first work out there, too. What's your best advice that you could give them? My best advice to them is take your time do it right. Fulton Books was a great for me. I had no idea what I was doing. They led me through this entire thing. But the main thing is, is just be patient and it'll come to you as far as like the proper illustrations, the proper editing and everything like that. Mm. The book is titled All in a Nutshell and it's written by Brian Vernier. You can find this everywhere like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and it's published by Fulton Books. Brian, it was really great having you here tonight. I had a nice time talking with you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everything that you do for authors out there. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Kathleen Bashore. Kathy, thank you so much for being here tonight. 
Thank you. It's a pleasure, Corey. It's really great to have you on the show today, Kathy. I just wanted to congratulate you on having a book. It's out right now called Choose Joy, Beloved, Out of a Mother's Grief into the Father's Arms. Can you tell me what readers can expect? Well, I think they can expect the unexpected, actually, because that's what happened for me when I began writing the book based on the impressions I was receiving, what I was hearing from God on it was very surprising. So it's not a book on how to grieve. It's not. Everybody grieves differently, but it will contain some surprises about how heaven views us here on the earth and the grieving process. So I think they'll see some surprises in it. Hmm. Now, after coming off the first book into this one, was this one that you had planned to write off the bat along with the first, or is this something that sort of came into your mind after the first was published? No, the first book, I had to be told in a dream that I was supposed to write the story of raising our daughter who just had extreme mental health issues Mm. like nothing I had ever seen. And that took me a while. I really resisted because it requires you to be vulnerable Mm. and put some things out there that will potentially help other people. So that book didn't take me that long to write once I went through my notes. I journal all the time. The second book, I did not expect at all to write because Kelsey had moved to heaven and I didn't want to write it. And, you know, you're in these extreme grief places, so there's nothing that comes into your mind about that. But it gradually began to dawn on me, this is a story that God wants me to put out there. So I put myself, it just kind of determined that I needed to do this and uh, just prayed for grace and it came out. Hmm. (laughs) Kathy, what kinds of readers do you think would really benefit from this? First of all, the first book, although people would think it would be for people who have special needs children, I found that it reached people who had problems with striving and trying to do everything in their own strength. Mm. This second book could actually, I'm not sure, you know, people that are going through grief could take it the wrong way. They could feel like, you know, they should be able to get through this quicker, but it's not like that at all. And I, I really hope I made that clear in the book. It's like, I'm just telling you my story and what I heard. And I found it very comforting. So certainly the second book, For anybody who loses somebody, I'm praying that they'll receive healing and comfort from reading what I heard from God. Hmm. And like you said, the second book was sort of an unexpected thing for you to write. Are there any kinds of plans for more writing in the future? Oh, yes. I write constantly. I have an email list, and every day, I'm whatever I'm hearing or sensing of an encouraging nature, I put out to the people. So there's so much that you kind of assume other people know, but they don't really. Hmm. I'm also a psychologist, so... When I work with people, I find that they just do not understand the deep things going on inside of them. And I have, I think, valuable information I can put out there for people, even in practical kind of step form. So I'm thinking about that for my next book to deal with when people get stuck in negative cycles, but make it very readable, easy to understand. Hmm. So, Kathy, if you can picture the moment where you got the first copy of Choose Joy Beloved in the mail, you got to open the box and out it comes. You get to hold it in your hands for the first time. What was that moment like for you? Well, it was a mixture because of what the book was about. The first four chapters, of course, you know, were very, very difficult to write. So it was a mixture. The first book, it was like joy and like, wow, I actually did this. The second book, it was a mixture. There was more of the pain still on it thinking like, well, I never would have had to write this if Kelsey were still here. But overall, the book itself is very beautiful. I really love how they did the cover. And so I felt that mixture of pain, but also expectation, like I'm really hoping that this will help people. Mm. Now that you've been writing for a while and you've been through this process so many times, what advice would you have for the listeners right now who are authors just starting out, they need to get their first book out there? Well, I didn't know I was a writer. (laughs) I just journal a lot. People often don't know. You think, well, here's my identity. I'm a psychologist. This is what I do. But I didn't realize I was a writer. That's really different. I didn't have any training in it. I just love words. But at this point, I would just say, if you don't see yourself a certain way, but you find yourself journaling a lot, just start to do it. Any amount of writing you do any day is going to be helpful. Mm. So I would say just keep at it. Do, do those goals every day of maybe, you know, what did they say about one email is like writing so much of your book, you know, you put more words in an email than you realize. Mm-hmm. So even that, think of yourself writing a couple emails a day and putting down some ideas and just let it flow. You'll be surprised at what starts to come out. Well, Kathy, thank you for using everything you've gone through in your life to reach out and to help others. I encourage my listeners to check out this book. It's called Choose Joy, Beloved, Out of a Mother's Grief into the Father's Arms. 
It's written by Kathleen Bashore, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can pick this up everywhere. You get your books like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Kathy, thank you again for joining me tonight. I had such a great time talking. Thank you, Corey. I did, too. The Lord versus Corruption. This is the new book. It's out in stores right now. It's written by Rand Tubbs, and I'm really happy that Rand is right here with me now. Rand, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. Can you tell me all about your book, The Lord vs. Corruption? Well, it's um, really a continuation of a testimonial book I wrote back in 95, 96, about many supernatural events that ha happened to me for three and a half years when I was sick and dying with what I know now is chronic fatigue syndrome. Back then, there was no answer to it. You know, in the beginning of, of my first testimony book, I put that if the Lord ever guides me to find my other son that I supernaturally was shown existed, then I'd write a full book about it. And I started having visions of how to find Justin 14, 15 years later. And that's what this book is about. And there was a lot of corruption involved in, in how I was shown to find my other son. Wow. Rand, what kinds of readers were you targeting whenever you wrote this? You know, just people that are interested in, in faith and in the Lord, and especially people just coming to Jesus because there's proof that Jesus heals in it. You know, there's proof of hell. There's proof that people are judged when they die. You know, it just doesn't end. You either go up or down, and there's judgment there because the Lord told me that, you know, and I didn't even know what the word meant. And then that all came true, too, to, you know, to make, I don't want to give my whole book away, but you know what I mean. <laughs> And then after all that time, when you got that first copy of this book in your hands, what was that like for you? Relief. It was, it was a giant relief because it's been very hard for me to write this book. Mm. I'm not really a writer. You know, I'm more left brain where I was like math and science and I did, couldn't stand English in high school and things <laughs> like that. But I had to keep my word to Lord that, you know, if I ever found my skinny leg son, that I'd write a full book about it. It was hard. Mm. So there's a lot of relief when I, when I got my first copy. There's a lot of relief, you know. Rand, a lot of our listeners don't think that they could be authors either. What advice would you give them? I know it's a lot more work than, than you know, some people might imagine. Mm. I've never been an author. I really didn't desire to be an author in a sense, except way back in the middle of the 90s. I wanted to put down this testimony, and you know, I made many copies myself, probably you know, 120, and hand them out to many people. Even my son's name was prophesied in there because I heard it from a lady outside a dream you know, where it just said, isn't that Justin's father? So I wrote that down. And, you know, that didn't have to be his name. When I saw his toothpick legs and saw him skip and hop like my dad, his name could have been anything. But it was supposed to be Justin, and it was, you know. Have you given any thought to writing another book after this? You know, the only possibility I, I see the continuation of this book, you know, through like a grandson or a granddaughter because there will be proof there. And hopefully I'll get to know the other side of the family, you know, eventually in time. You know, there, I don't know if you've read my book, you wouldn't know detail, but there's a point where I just heard a voice from the other side. It sounded like an old man's voice, it just said grandson. And it was just before I went to prison. And I kind of think that he's a key to this. I'm not really sure, you know, but it's just, I'm not sure what else it meant. You know, there's different First, I thought it was just one of my grandfathers, you know, saying grandson that they were like proud of me from heaven that I never knew because they weren't alive when I was born. Afterwards, I think it's more about my own grandson. Rand, you said this wasn't an easy book for you to write. How did you get through those moments when the writing got especially tough? It was hard. I would just quit writing for, you know, for so many hours or whatever, and then go back in the, be in the basement in the little room where I tried to write and carry on, and then you know, you'd scratch off this page and that page and, and try to re reword it. Then I had to try to shorten it all once it was all down once. I, you know, I couldn't find, you know, much professional help either. I did most of it all by myself. Mm. You said when you got the first copy of this in your hands, you felt such a wave of relief wash over you. Would you say then that was the most rewarding part when you think about the whole thing of being published and, and being a published author? It was a great relief to me that, you know, as I wanted to keep my word to the Lord. And there's also a little hope of some justice in here for me. And, you know, there's a drive there, too, of course. So injustice doesn't really ever go away until it's justified. Mm. You talked about not seeing yourself as much of a writer. Uh, do you do much reading? I really don't don't really read that much. I'm math and science again. And when I when I do read, it's, it's usually going to be nonfiction or it's going to be spiritual. The title of the book is The Lord Versus Corruption. This is written by Rand Tubbs and it's published by Fulton Books. Of course, you can get this everywhere that you shop for books like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and traditional brick and mortar stores. Rand, I really enjoyed our time together here tonight on the show. Thank you so much again for joining me. Thank you too. Been a pleasure. 
Donovan's Run. It's a fantastic, thrilling, and mysterious trip through time and space. It's the new novel. It's out in stores right now. It's written by William S. Frankel, M.D., and I'm really happy that William's right here with me now to talk about it. William, thank you so much for being here tonight. My pleasure. Donovan's Run sounds really exciting. Can you tell me about it? Well, it's a story of two individuals, a very important individual who is a scientist and his uh, very close friend who is a very important individual in the the area of theology. He's a minister. Mm. It's basically they were very interested in the possibility of finding special individuals in outer space and possibly uh, also in far out space find God. Mm. So can you think back to how you got the idea for this story? Yes, the uh, idea came because of all of the interesting ideas concerning going far out into space. And we're seeing the initial kinds of space interests for uh, at least the past 20 or 30 years. And because of that, I thought that this might be an interesting book to attempt to think what would happen 500,000 years from now Mm -hmm. in terms of our early searches in uh, space. When it comes to writing and publishing books, have you ever done anything like this before? Yes, this is my sixth book. Mm. It's been mostly set in here in this world, but Donovan's Run is set initially here in this world, but far beyond it in the book. Now, when you look back over it all, over all the books you've written and published, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author now? It's an interesting feeling of expressing some of my thoughts out to the public. And what sorts of readers do you think would really be into Donovan's Run? I think young individuals who are so very interested in going out into space. I might say that with things that are being developed now, I think not only young people, but A lot of older folks are going to be interested in the possibilities of finding out some amazing things in outer space. Donovan's Run sounds like it may have taken you quite a while to write and put through the publishing process. Was that the case? I've been working on it for five years. And what's that feeling like whenever you get that first physical copy in your hands, you get to hold that for the first time? It's very, um, I think it, it's very wonderful. It's a realization of so much work, and there it is. Hmm. You know, William, a lot of our listeners right now are authors just starting out. They don't have a book out. They're looking to get themselves out there. Do you have any words of advice that you could offer them? Yes, write what they are interested in. And do not be concerned about what is being written is not picked up because of your beginning. Keep writing, keep writing, and make certain that you do this until people begin to pick it up. Readers looking for a fantastic, thrilling, mysterious trip through time and space, like I said, should check out Donovan's Run. It's written by William S. Frankel, M.D., and it's published by Fulton Books. Of course, you can pick this up everywhere, like Amazon, and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and Google Play, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. William, thank you again for joining me tonight. I had a great time learning about Donovan's Run, and a really nice time talking with you. It was my pleasure to be talking to you as well, and I hope that you will enjoy reading Donovan's Run as well. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. 
or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.